Hello and welcome to the Window Gallery for Invented Instruments, virtual artist reception for Aaron Soloway, somewhere else. My name is David Samus and I direct the gallery's activities alongside Bart Hopkin and Kirk Pearson, who curate. And today we're talking about the exhibition Somewhere Else by Aaron Soloway. It's visible and can be heard through the windows of our gallery at 55 Taylor Street at the Center for New Music in San Francisco. The gallery itself is open weekdays nine to five and half an hour before the beginning of concerts, but the piece is meant to be viewed from the sidewalk and can be heard from outside. Uh, the peak viewing times are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. or on the weekends from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Throughout March and April, we will be exhibiting Grist from the Mills, an exhibition of work by the outstanding music faculty at the historic Mills Music Program. This exhibit is guest curated by Dr. Sudhu Tuari and includes work by Chris Brown, Fred Frith, Wendy Reed, Letitia Tsunami, John Bischoff, Maggie Payne, Roscoe Mitchell, and Daniel Schmidt. In May and June, Musician and instrument inventor Chris Bobrowski will be curating Orchestra Obscura, which is a group show of new interfaces by the College of San Mateo Electronic Music students. The Center for New Music is once again open for in-person concerts. Please take a look at their website at centerfornewmusic.com. We are available to assist artists in grant writing, performance opportunity, and networking within the community. Staff is also available to help you produce streaming concerts, and one of the best perks of membership is getting the use of the space for an in-person or streaming concert for no additional charge. As always, 100% of the ticket sales go to our artists, so please consider supporting our mission by becoming a member. Today we'll have a conversation between Aaron Soloway and Bart Hopkin. Bart Hopkin is an instrument inventor and composer and curator here at the Window Gallery for Invented Instruments. Aaron Soloway is an experimental designer. His point of view has been wrought by deep work in human-centered design, research, and development, extensive audio engineering, and a lifelong devotion to music. You can find out more about his work at AaronSoloway.com. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. Today, we're uh, talking about the current show at the Window Gallery in the San Francisco Center for New Music. It's called Somewhere Else, and it is put together by our guest, Aaron Soloway. Aaron, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, it's so great to see you. And thank you for all of the rest of you for coming tonight, even though I can't see you because <laughs> this is not a live presentation. A real shame that we're having to do this by Zoom once again, but uh, we hope to be back live to in-person receptions sometime soon. <laughs> okay, um, so Aaron, you have this show called Somewhere Else. Right. Um, let me just ask you the wide open question. What is Somewhere Else? Uh, somewhere Else is kind of a transportation from this uh, site down in the Tenderloin to have like a little moment of uh, somewhere else. So it's a uh, sonic transportation to basically the ocean, the sounds of the ocean. And it's, it's really meant for this kind of moment in particular with COVID happening and where we can't meet indoors. And so the, the, one of the inspirations was that you have to be outside the gallery to experience it. <clears throat> and so it's using a uh, camera with uh, some video effects that basically make you able to see some of your past movements through time. And then it uses these drivers, these uh, speakers that attach to the windows. So the windows actually become uh, speakers. And so when you stand outside of this, uh, this uh, installation, you can see yourself inside with the background of where you are at that moment. But when your presence is detected, it then makes the background go away uh, using this feature that a lot of people use in these Zoom calls. Um, and it brings in the sounds of the ocean.
So basically you get this little sonic journey somewhere else. Right, nicely expressed through the sounds that are actually uh, coming off the window glass at, serving as a radiator. There's drivers right on the glass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and so there's a, there's a real feeling there, uh, especially at night, by the way, because it, it, it sort of comes to life, especially at night. Yeah. And um, how did you decide, as, as we've said, the, you're not seeing a, an extremely literal representation on the back wall of the scene that the camera is seeing. So what did you do here? It's not gonna be just a literal video of what the camera is seeing. Right. So. I was really inspired by some of these uh, strobe uh, photos where you see like a, a runner or a dancer moving across a frame. But you see them kind of frozen at uh, every step of the way. And so that seemed really nice because you, you get a chance to kind of capture motion. You're not thinking about one particular moment. You're thinking about how somebody moves across time, through time, through space. And that was a really big inspiration and uh, basically why I went in this direction of um, trying to highlight the outlines of people and then capturing that at discrete moments over time and having them overlap. So it's a little bit trying to take you out of uh, the specific moment and give you an experience of uh, being reflective of like how you've moved maybe, maybe across the window gallery. Uh, so that's that was one kind of initial inspiration, um, uh, more coming from like kind of visual photography uh, ideas of this uh, strobe photography, but also long exposures. Okay, and what about color? Yeah, the color is pretty uh, minimal. I would say it's it's black and white, and that's uh, largely because I want things to overlap well. And since we're projecting onto a white wall, I basically want the outlines to really cut. So uh, that's a lot easier with the higher contrast. Uh, though when you are kind of transported and the background is removed, it's replaced by a uh, kind of deep blue to subtly suggest, reinforce the ocean um, uh, experience. Okay. And I, you know, we could also say it's cool looking. <laughs> I mean, you, you could have abstracted it all kinds of ways. The way you did it is, is very visually striking, very, very, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's pleasing to the eye in interesting and, and slightly odd ways. Uh, and also slightly odd is the relationship between uh, how, okay, I'm standing in front of this window now, I move. What I see is not an exact replication of my movement. As you said, it's sort of a series of stills. Yep. There, and there's, there's a quality of, of delay to it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a quality of, of, of abstraction of the movement. Yep. And even some sort of freeze frame moment. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really cool because you get to kind of paint with your hands. And um, yeah, I think that's a really cool element. Usually you're just seeing, you know, whatever moment you're seeing is that moment. You don't really see like a lingering effect of how people moved through uh, space in front of you. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to change your perspective on, on time. And uh, I think when you're in a moment of transportation, you often have a, a changed sense of time, like time is slower or faster. Uh, you know, if you go on vacation, you might feel like it's going really slowly, but then you, know, you think it's, it, it's over too soon. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I think the two elements are kind of trying to be complementary in terms of uh, this idea of transportation. So there's space and time and kind of playing with that. Right, right. Now, another consideration might have been for you, um, people are very wary of having themselves be filmed sometimes. <laughs> and, and uh, and people, well, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Did you have to think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a consideration. I think when uh, I was setting up and outside the window to check how I was looking and everything, some people walked by and asked if it was a, an FBI <laughs> installation. <laughs> so yeah, people are definitely wary of being filmed and that type of thing. Um, 
but I think that this is, it's, it's definitely not a hidden, you know, it's, there's nothing uh, discreet about it. It's, it's pretty, pretty obvious that you're uh, there to interact with this kind of effect, the visual effect and the, the sound. So um, yeah, I think trying to highlight that and make it seem uh, like an invitation rather than something, you know, invasive is, is more the goal. <clears throat> and I think we can also say that the, the visual, the image as it appears on the back wall is highly abstracted. So, yep. it, you know, I don't have to say somebody's stealing my identity. It's something else that somebody is getting from me. It, it's, it's uh, a, a much more abstracted sense of movement than it is a picture of me. Yeah, absolutely. But, which uh, is nice. I mean, it, it really works well. And, and uh, there may have been a bit of virtue, uh, making a virtue of necessity kind of thing going on here, where the fact that we didn't, I think you didn't want it to be a very explicit picture of somebody, uh, put you in a position where you could abstract in interesting ways. Yeah, I think definitely where one of the primary visual effects is capturing outlines you really lose a lot of the, the detail. Like if you get up real close to it, you can see some detail of your face, um, but where there's so much overlap of the previous uh, moments, you kind of start to build up with that. Yeah, with that much overlap, it's really kind of, it gets a bit noisy in I think a nice way. Yeah. Um, and you get to see kind of an outline of movement uh, versus just one very uh, like, exacting uh, image of somebody's face. It's more of like uh, the gist of their movement over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can get more, a little more into background, but let's start by just talking about a, a, a random example of something that you've done. And I think when I asked you this question, what, what, what is a good representative? You said, well, how about uh, beach ball synth? So what is beach ball synth? Right, so Beach Ball Synth uh, was an interactive installation uh, at MoogFest 2016, and we made it, I was working at IDEO at the time, this uh, design consultancy, and basically it was a, a project where we got to be completely creative and uh, compared to client work where we were often trying to solve a specific problem of a business or a client. Uh, and so this was really about coming up with a, a creative idea for this uh, art, music, technology festival, Moogfest. And so we built this uh, over about six, maybe six or a bit more months, a number of prototypes, and then came up with this idea that was the beach ball synth. So these giant beach balls that were made to be smart, basically with electronics and sensors. So when you hit them, uh, you were playing a musical note. Uh, and so we had six of these in one space, and there's also a generative uh, musical kind of foundation. So you, you enter the space, there's already kind of music happening, uh, like a foundation. And then when you hit these beach balls, which is fun, even without sound, <laughs> uh, they, they add notes to this foundation.
that that's a pretty good example of a lot of the uh, a big category of the work that I've done, where it's interactive. It involves a physical interaction, uh, understanding like how that connects to sensors, building those sensor systems. In this case, accelerometers and gyroscopes, um, and then how that connects back to some kind of feedback. How does that interaction become a sound? How does that sound exist within this bed of sounds? And how do we make that easy for somebody to in, kind of intuit how it's going to work and then interact with it and have a fun time without worrying too much about you know, how it actually works? And so a lot of my work tends to be similar in, in the sense that you kind of have a vague broad idea of what you want to do. And then you, you use these prototypes to iterate and get closer to what you think is going to uh, be a good experience. And really like not just thinking at, uh, abstractly, but building things that work with electronics and software and sound uh, to and putting them in front of people to make sure that people get it or understand what they don't get and then kind of incorporating those insights into the final product. Um, speaking of the, this, this uh, underlying background of sound, you've used this word generative a couple of times. What does that mean? Yeah, so I think one of the really interesting things about generative art is uh, you really get to define this idea like a small little idea potentially, and then see how that manifests over time. Uh, and so uh, the reason that kind of was of use <clears throat> for this beach ball synth installation was that we were gonna be doing this for 40 hours over one week. And, you know, after about five minutes, if you're looping something, you start to get kind of tired of it uh, oftentimes. So I really, really was curious about uh, this idea of how do I create 40 hours of music in less than one hour? And so uh, that's a question that you can actually answer with uh, generative uh, approaches. And so basically what I did was I chose orchestration. So what sounds I wanted to use, so I had this like palette of sounds. And then I used some uh, tools that help you create rhythmic kind of uh, personality. So I can say, this is gonna be you know, a bass instrument and kind of infrequent notes and this type of rhythm. And you kind of add things up and you really get like a, a cohesive sound. And so you hear this, this uh, music and it sounds the same or similar, but never exactly the same. And that's, that's really kind of interesting because, um, you know, over 40 hours, if you never hear the same thing, but you always hear the same character, that's kind of a very different approach to music making, then <clears throat> I'm gonna get these like three minutes of a pop song exactly right. Um, you know, it's probably more in the ballpark of ambient music uh, uh, or something more that's like a, almost a background. I think ambient can be more of like a background or like wallpaper. Mm -hmm. And I think generative music is somewhere, it can be somewhere between where it's, it's actually, music in that you have discrete notes and there's really um, musical effect, but um, it's not, you know, uh, always doing cadences and concluding all the time. So, and then the, the, the sounds that emerged from the beach balls were designed to relate to the kind of things you would set up with this. Yeah, exactly. So basically at the most basic level, you can't play a wrong note. So you're always playing within the key of the foundation music. So that means it, it gives people who might be not very confident about like contributing musically, like, oh, I don't play music. I don't interact with music. Um, well, now you can, and you're not gonna get it like wrong. You can just kind of have a, have a fun time. How big were the beach balls? Pretty huge. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think with the diameter, maybe like, was it eight or 10 feet? The big oh. ones were eight or 10 feet diameter. And we had, I think, three of those and three of the slightly smaller ones. Um, and were they just kind of lying around on the 
floor when people walked in? Uh, so they're actually suspended. So they're swinging. So the, the cool thing about that is that when you hit them, uh, they can actually swing and then come back and hit other ones. So it's kind of like, uh, not only are you creating um, the note when you hit it, but you might be creating a note when it hits something else. And when it hits something else, it might be another beach ball and that might create another note too. So it's really kind of uh, complex in that way where it, it, uh, it can become kind of chaotic. <laughs> You know, you've had a number of quite interesting institutional affiliations over the years. So what is IDEO? Am I saying it right? Yeah, IDEO. Uh -huh. Yeah, so IDEO is a uh, global design consultancy. And so basically what they do, they're really well known for being uh, using human-centered design. So not saying we have this cool technology, let's try to find a use for it, uh, rather saying, we have this human problem, uh, you know, people hate flossing, I don't know. And then you wanna like design around, <laughs> around this and come up with a, a way to make people maybe wanna floss more. So, and in that process, you kind of do user research. So you go and talk to people, you then get ideas and prototype these ideas uh, with like physical uh, prototypes and put those back in front of people and kind of iterate. So you're really kind of, using user research and building uh, together to um, figure out new approaches for uh, sometimes pretty uh, vexing problems, I guess. Yeah. Well, just for fun, let's, let's, let's talk about one other thing you've done in the past. You could suggest something or I could throw something out. So I'll say, um, I am aware <laughs> from having spoken with you and looked at your website and stuff that you've done some things that involve uh, discs. That's true. So basically the idea here is that you have uh, six rings and they're little divots. You can kind of maybe hear. Um, and so they're actually very precisely spaced and the number is very important too. So when you spin this and you hit it, you touch it with a, like a guitar pick or something, it will create a frequency. And these frequencies actually create the uh, pentatonic scale. Um, and so from just ridges, you can actually create uh, a musical scale and an instrument. So that was kind of uh, the first step in this, um, you know, using very precise uh, fabrication to create a musical scale. And then I'd, I'd met you, I think, I don't know, a year or two after that. And I was really inspired by your musical siren, which I, I thought was interesting because it looked like it had been drilled by hand. And I was like, oh, wow, this would be, you know, a perfect thing for laser cutting.
yeah, it was really cool to try try a number of these ideas out and not only look at the acoustic properties, but also the kind of strobe properties uh, using free, different frequencies of light to make these rotating disks look like they're spinning uh, or standing still uh, based on their kind of like frequency resonances. And, you know, in, despite of the fact that we were communicating at that time, Aaron, I never really saw that. So it, it probably looked really cool. These interesting stroke things that you could do, make things hold still or move and a variety of interesting effects. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, but very hard to show in Zoom because <laughs> yes, right. it'll kind of be there. <laughs> you, get the visual, you get some kind of weird moray patterns or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, very cool. Um, you know, your your own background uh, when you were younger, you actually were, I don't know if you were primarily a musician or what, but you were, you were trained as, I think, a bassoonist and a pianist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a really big part of kind of my high school days and before uh, I went to a lot of music festivals and summers to play in orchestras uh, and and really kind of, uh, I guess, drove me to, I was also into electronic music and that type of thing. And in college, I uh, got a lot more into electronics and recording and electronic music stuff. Um, and so that was kind of a big transition from like more classical to electronic and production and uh, composition. Was it, um, I mean, was it sort of arbitrary? I'm tired of doing that, now I'm gonna do this? Or was there some kind of trajectory or something that, that moved you in these directions? Yeah, so I think one of the big things was, um, you know, I felt like I, I could play bassoon and piano like pretty well. And I tried to make a recording and it sounded kind of terrible <laughs> and you know I was confused it's like it sounds nice in the room here but when I record it it sounds very one-dimensional and bad and I think that was kind of this light bulb moment of like uh, you know how critical our auditory perception is in terms of um, understanding and uh, reacting to sound and music and I think that's why I got a lot more into learning about production, learning about effects, uh, studying electrical engineering, um, and really trying to understand at the most fundamental level, how, to, how do these things work? Why do they work? Why do we relate to them? Uh, how might we relate to them more? And what part does our perception play in that? I think that's, that's really a big connection with like, uh, uh, why mimicking the hearing system in some of these devices was really interesting for me because it felt like getting getting closer to some kind of uh, understanding of how part of it works. Um, of course, that's only a very small, small part of <laughs> everything. Uh, but um, yeah, I think that that also led to really thinking about the human role in experiences and then getting involved in human-centered design and uh, really trying to keep this idea of uh, what's meaningful for the human experience in these different um, uh, interactions. Uh, well, listen, this has been a great pleasure. Aaron, this has been a great pleasure talking with you. To everybody who's tuned in, uh, thank you for joining us today. A big thanks to the Center for New Music for making all of this stuff possible. And Aaron and everybody else, we're going to close out now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bart. <laughs>